Hello everyone and welcome to Meet Me at the Table. This is Colin and today we are going to have some fun journeying in Middle Earth doing the card game War of the Ring, the card game using the latest released expansion called the Against the Shadow expansion. This expansion allows you to play either solo or co-op against the shadow player. The shadow player is controlled by two bots. We've got the Sauron bot and the Saruman bot over there. I will be doing the full trilogy scenario, which is not going to be short, <laughs> but that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to show you how this game plays and how much fun this is. I, I will say right now, do not watch this for strategy. Anybody watching this for strategy, find a different one. I've only played this game four times, and I don't think I've even won yet. But if you want to learn how to play this, see if this is something you're interested in picking up, especially to play solo or co-op, then uh, feel free to stay here. Just like always, make sure to turn on those Klingon subtitles just in case I miss anything in editing and someone tells me in comments, I can put it in that Klingon subtitle. Without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into setup. Grab yourself a cup of coffee. We'll jump right in. The first part of setup is determining which scenario you want to play. There's a trilogy scenario, a fellowship scenario, there's a dual scenarios. There's also some scenarios online that have been made by the designer, which is kind of cool as well. Uh, but we're going to do the trilogy scenario. That's where you're playing with two different decks against. So it's essentially a 2v2 going through all of the Lord of the Rings story. You'll then want to create two 30 card decks for the two free people's decks. One deck will have the wizards, it'll have the hobbits, and it will have the Rohirrim together. The other deck will have the Gondorians, and it will have the Elves, if I can find them in here. There's not many, as we know with the story of Lord of the Rings, there's not a ton of Elves left, uh, but you'll have the Elves and the Gondorians together. Each deck will be 30 cards. You'll want to shuffle those up and you're good to go there. Because of the scenario we're playing, we also grab one of these ring tokens for each of our decks, at the end of the game, if we do not use that ring, we can gain an extra victory point because this is a victory point game at the end of the day. We're going to try and score more victory points than the AI bots. If during the game, though, we want to use the ring, which is always tempting, you can use the ring once per game, flip it over. We then forego that point at the end of the game, but then we get to draw two cards. And you're going to see drawing cards is super helpful for us. The two bots will also have two decks. One is the Sauron deck, and the other one is Saruman, and then you're going to have the Monst Monstrosity cards, and you're going to have the Haradrim cards. Okay, And they're each also 30 cards, except for I did have two uh, promo cards that came with the expansion, and so I put them in, so each one is actually 31 cards large. I'll shuffle these two decks up as well. The cards in our decks are going to consist of characters, armies, items, events, all things that when you see, if you know the story of Lord of the Rings, you're going to go, oh, that's from this piece. <laughs> now, that is what we're going to be playing out and what the AI bots are going to be playing out. But what are they going to be playing those cards out to? Well, we are going to have battlefields and there are free people battlefields and shadow player battlefields, seven of each. So each of these, we're just going to take them, shuffle them up. And these are going to come out outside of canon, meaning that we might have Minas Tirith be our first battleground, which doesn't make any sense. The part that follows the canon of the story will be the path cards. These are super cool. There are path cards labeled one to nine. There's three for each of the different sets. And whenever we move to a different leveled path card, you're going to randomly draw the next one. All of these cards will have locations that make sense for the storyline itself. And once we have completed the ninth one, uh, one of the three and ninth ones, and we've ended that round, the game will be over. We'll then count up our victory points. When you play competitively, there's actually a check for victory points at the end of each round, because if one of the sets of players, the shadow or the free people, have 10 more victory points than the other team, it's an immediate win for that team. Against the bots, we don't check until the end of the game. That means no matter what, we're going to get to Mordor. We'll just see how banged up we are when we get there. I do want to call out from this expansion, there are a few replacement path cards and battlegrounds to make them make more sense for the bot players. So you'll replace those in your stacks when you're playing, uh, just when you're going against the bots. They have the same location, they might just have slightly different effects. 
This is the turn order tracker. Now I'm going to use this on the side. You won't be seeing this, but this just helps me <laughs> keep track of who is going to activate next. This game is a bunch of micro turns, meaning that when it's your turn, you're not going to play all the cards in your hand. You're going to do a single action and then it's going to move to the next player. So we have our four decks. We have our Frodo deck. And so once they do an action, then we would move to the Witch King. From there, we would then move to the Aragorn deck. From there, we move to the Saruman deck. And we just keep going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then at the end of the round, uh, Frodo will no longer be the first player. It'll be the Witch King. And then we'll start to go around like this. And we'll keep doing that until the end of that ninth path card. And then we'll count up our score. And we have to beat the Shadow player. So if the Shadow player ties us, if the two Shadow players tie us, then they win. The final part of setup is we all draw a total of seven cards and then cycle two of them. For the bot player, that just means I'm going to draw a total of seven cards and put them over here. After I've done so, I'm going to grab the top two and simply set them sideways over here. And this will be their cycle pile. I'll keep them face down. I'm not going to look at them, so I don't know which cards they've cycled. Think of this as your discard pile. After your deck runs out, you're going to take that cycled pile, shuffle them up, and it becomes your deck again. So these cards aren't out of the game. There are cards that will be eliminated. When they're eliminated, they're totally out of the game. So as you play the game, you're going to lose cards from your deck, and your deck's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. You're going to use cards that are going to get eliminated or forsaken or whatever, and then all of a sudden, you're only going to have little bits of your deck left at the end of the game. It's really cool how that works. I've completed the setup for our Witch King player, and I've now also set up the Saruman player. Now let's do ours because those we get to look at the cards. Let's draw our seven cards for both decks and then I'll determine which two to cycle because I can work together to try and determine which cards we want to keep. So our first one we have on here is Helbred. Oh, Helbred is great. Okay, a few things that you want to see here. First, he's a character. That's good to know. He can be placed on the path, but he can only be placed on the path for uh, rounds two and three not for the first path card that comes out. If he's placed in a location where he's going to battle, one of the battle grounds, he can provide a shield. And up here, he has a leadership icon. What that means is on his own, he doesn't add any attack, but if there's an army of the same faction type, he'll add plus one. He also has an ability. I'm not gonna read all of those to you right now. You're gonna see them as we, as we play. We've got Elrond. Wow, that's awesome, that's two. Uh, we have the Great Gate. That's three. Then we have Arwen. Oh my gosh, what a stacked hand. We have some high elves. And we have Denethor. Is he really, should he really be on the good side? <laughs> I don't know. And we have Galadriel. So our starting hand is actually pretty stacked with a bunch of good characters. Our Frodo, Rohirrim, Hobbit, Wizard. Oh my gosh, there's so many things in this deck. Let's see. Okay, we've got Nariel. Okay, this is an, an item. It can only be attached on Gandalf. So I don't have Gandalf. That's probably an easy cycle. Our next one is Fatty Bulger. Okay, we have a Hobbit in our hand. That's good. Uh, we have Shadow Facts. Oh my gosh, where's Gandalf? I've got two other. Oh, we got Sam. <laughs> one, two, three, four. We have Eowyn. That's five. We have Frodo. Oh my gosh, we have all the Hobbits with us. And I think we get to draw one more. We do have Gandalf the Grey. That is amazing. We have Gandalf, plus we have Narya, plus we have Shadow Facts. Wow, lots of good things here. I have to cycle two cards, and remember that doesn't mean we'll never see them again, but this hurts. That was such a great starting hand. I guess I'm going to cycle Eowyn and Sam Gamgee. For the Aragorn deck, I guess we're going to give up the High Elves and Denethor. We will cycle these two. We've completed our setup. Let's talk about the game round and the different actions that we can take. The AI is going to use a flowchart, which I'll show you when they start activating. For us, we play just like it's a regular game. So how the game round works, we first have our location step. The starting player, which will be Frodo, activates one battleground and then one path, and that'll always be the next numbered path. So for us right now, that's number one. After that, we'll do the action step. Players take turns, taking actions or passing, beginning with the starting player. So we'll start with the Frodo player that has Gandalf in his hand and Frodo. Does it get better than that? We'll keep taking actions until all of us pass consecutively. So this is one of those games where you can pass and then jump in with an action and then continue passing. There are certain restrictions on when you can pass. We'll talk about that as we play. After that, we will move to the combat step and we'll resolve combat on the active battleground and path. You can do it in any order that you'd like. We'll skip the victory check. We'll then go to the draw step. 
each free peeper players draw three cards. Generally, the shadow player would draw four in the competitive game. If you're playing on standard, which I'm going to do because I did not win this last time I played against them, uh, you will have the draw of the bots be one less than normal. So they'll also only draw three cards instead of four. Here we have the actions that we can take during our turn. We can play a single card from our hand by cycling another card in our hand. So every time you play a card, you have to cycle a card. Yeah, I know. That stinks. You can move one character or army in reserve to an active path or battleground. The catch for us is if we put something in the reserve, we cannot in the same round move it from the reserve to a battleground or a path. The bots, that does not apply. They can do that. You can just cycle a card from your hand. You can winnow by eliminating two cards from your hand to draw a card. Don't recommend doing that often. You can use an action to resolve the use the action to ability, or you can use a ring token. Instead of taking an action, you may pass if the number of cards in your hand is less than or equal to your carryover limit, and everyone's carryover limit is two. So we can carry over two cards in hand between the different rounds. That's same with the bot players for now. Or the number of cards in your hand is less than each of your enemy players. So if I only had three cards in hand and the enemy players both had five cards, I could still pass even if I have more cards than my carryover limit because both of them have more cards in hand than I do. The fertile player will grab the top free people's battleground and flip it over and we have Dal Amroth. Its northern shore defined part of Cobus Haven, the small bay in which the Morthrond River flowed. Upon the headland, the princes of Dal Amroth established a castle, and thus Dal Amroth referred to this stronghold and to the neighboring port city, the chief city of the Fife of Belfalas. Within the walls of the city was the seaward Tower of Tirith Air, which had a bell that was rung for the benefit of the mariners. All free people battlegrounds will have a benefit for one of the players. This one is a benefit for the Dunedain player, which is the Strider deck. It says the Dunedain player may forsake one card to draw one card. Looking at my hand, I really don't want to forsake anything that's on here, so I think I'm going to pass on doing that. I don't have to do that action. It is optional. Now, there's lots of things to see on this card itself. Over here, we can see that this location can only be assaulted by the Southrons. They cannot be assaulted by any of the Witch King armies. They, do, they don't have that specific symbol. Just like we're not going to be able to defend here with any of the Rohirrim. We can only defend with Gondorian or Wizard characters. So I could send Gandalf the Grey there and add his shields. This location has an inherent shield value of 2. If the Shadow players want to take it down, they need to have a total attack value of 3 or higher right now to do that. If they have an attack value of 2, defenders always win in Battlegrounds. With the Battlegrounds, whoever wins it gains this amount of victory points either side. If we defend it, we get one point. If the Shadow player takes it, they gain one victory point. Battlegrounds are also very interesting because whoever assaults this, if I'm assaulting this and attacking it, any of those characters or armies that I use to send and attack this location, they're going to be eliminated no matter what at the end of battle, regardless of if we win or lose. If I defend this and I end up not needing to defend with all of those shields, and so those characters' shields aren't used, they actually get cycled, which is nice. So right now we have the advantage that if the shadow player decides to attack this, any of those characters are gone forever. That, of course, will switch, though, when we move to any of these shadow player battlegrounds. We have our three level one path cards. We will pick this one. We have Gildor's Encampment. At the south end of the Green's Ward, there was an opening. There the green floor ran on into the wood and formed a wide space like a hall, roofed by the boughs of trees. Their great trunks ran like pillars down each side. In the middle, there was a wood fire blazing, and upon the tree pillars, torches with lights of gold and silver were burning steadily. The elves sat round the fire, upon the grass or upon the sawn rings of old trunks. Some went to and fro bearing cups and pouring drinks. Others brought food on heaped plates and dishes. This card states, the elf player draws one card, then cycles one card from hand. So this one, we will, for certain, draw a card. We drew Andrewil that can only be used by Aragorn or Strider. Oh boy, and I had a plan to get Aragorn or Strider out this turn. So the question becomes, do I feel like I need it? 
I think I'll cycle the Great Gate instead, so I'll keep Andril in my hand. On this path card, there's a few items I want you to see. The first one is this upper left hand number here. If we successfully defend the path, and this is something to note about the path, we're always the defender as the free people. The shadow is always attacking the path, trying to create corruption on that path, corrupting Frodo, the hobbits, anyone that they can that's on that path. We instead are trying to defend the path. So whenever the shadow player sends anyone to the path, all of those characters are going to be eliminated. And you're gonna see that you can never send an army on the path because that they didn't do that. <laughs> If we successfully defend the path, then we score that one point. If the shadow player wins the path, then the difference of how much they won by that path, they'll generate corruption. And they're gonna use these corruption tokens to keep track of their victory points for that. So for every corruption, they get a point at the end of the game. Some of the path cards have an inherent shield and it's gonna look a little different than the shields on the battlegrounds, but it's essentially the same thing. We already have one defense on here. So in order for the shadow player to beat us at Gildor's encampment, they would need to have two of the skull symbols, which you'll see in a bit, uh, but those are going to be used to try and offset our shields. We've now completed our setup and we're going to start trying to vie for control of these two uh, locations. Remember, we actually have control of both of them right now. If we just ended like this, we would get one victory point from this one and one from this one. I do also want to mention that throughout the game, you can have multiple ba battlegrounds active at the same time. I could have three or four of them. Whenever you're doing that against the bot player, you're always going to want to have them in order from left to right. So the new ones will come out to the right uh, because that will help them determine which ones they're going to send their armies or characters to. You can only ever have one active path though. If ever we change the path during the round, we will immediately resolve combat for that path and then we'll either draw the next numbered one or sometimes we can switch to uh, another path of the same number. It's all going to depend upon the abilities of the cards. Okay, that's enough talking. I think it's time for us to start playing. Frodo gets to do one action. For our first action, we are going to play Fatty Bulger. In order to do that, we do have to cycle a card in hand. What I'm going to do, as much as I love Shadow Facts and I have Gandalf in my hand, uh, there are two versions of Gandalf and there's two versions of Aragorn. We've got Gandalf the Grand, Gandalf the White. I'm hoping I can get Shadow Facts back for Gandalf the White. Since I'm gonna cycle it now, I'm gonna put it into my cycle deck so I can put out Fatty. Fatty has the ability, if in reserve, and I'm putting him in reserve, uh, you may use your action, and I, so I'll have to wait till my next turn, but I can use his action to eliminate this card and draw three cards. If in reserve when forsaken, cycle a card instead of eliminating it. The Frodo player has completed his first action. We now move to the Witch King. This is our flow chart. Yes, it looks daunting. It really isn't. I'll probably show you this a little bit and then we'll probably ignore it for a while and we'll just know what to do. There's certain instances where we will need to reference it, but most of the time it's gonna be straightforward. We always start at the top left. Can we use an action of a card that's out? And we always wanna use the word usefully here. We have to make sure the action is useful. They're not gonna do something that doesn't benefit them. Right now I don't have any cards out, so we follow the red line for no. Can they pass? No, they cannot pass. So we'll move to move. Can they move any cards? No, they can't move. So then they're gonna play. Play a random card from their hand. When they play that card, if it's an item, they're going to attach it to the rightmost wielder that they have out who can hold it. Otherwise, if it's a character, they can try and place it on the path if the shadow could conceivably win, but is currently losing, or the current path if it is the highest allowed in that scenario, which is number nine. You'll see what that means when we get all the way there, <laughs> as long as you're still watching. Uh, next, we have to the battleground. Can they go to the battleground? And on top of that, could they conceivably win it but are currently losing it? If they are, then they would go there. Finally, they'll go to the reserve. And you're going to see almost always they're going to start in the reserve, and then they might start moving pieces out of the reserve once they can conceivably win something. We'll flip that top card for the Witch King, and he has the Mordor Orcs. Right now, there's no place for that army to go, so we'll just simply place it in the reserve. We're now over to the Aragorn deck. We're going to start by playing Galadriel. We're going to cycle Andril. <laughs> I don't like it, but you know what? I got to do what I got to do. Uh, this says, when play, draw one card. So we'll draw a card, and we get Legolas. Well, that's cool. While in reserve, draw one additional card each draw step. So now I, I get to draw four cards each draw step instead of three, but then I do have to cycle one card in hand. We'll move to the Saruman player, drawing the top card for him. Oh, okay, this is a Southron character. 
which means technically he could go to Dal Amroth. However, you can see here he has a leadership icon. That means he actually doesn't bring any attack unless he has an army supporting him. So there's no reason for him to go there right now. He has an ability that states when played or moved to a battleground, each free people player must forsake one card. Right now though, there's no good place for him to go. He doesn't have anything in this bottom left hand side so he can't go onto the path. So he'll just be placed in reserve. Our Frodo player now will use Fatty Bulger's action. We're going to eliminate him so we can draw three cards. But he's now gone from the game. We'll never see him again. That was not a great draw, but actually what's nice is we have cards we can use to cycle to put out other cards. This one is actually not terrible. Uh, this says, if in play you may use your action and eliminate this card to take a Hobbit character from your cycle pile into your hand, which would mean we could get Sam. <laughs> uh, but this has to be attached either to Frodo or Sam, and hey, I have Frodo in my hand. The Witch King player will go next, drawing his next card, and we have Gothmog. This card cannot be played unless the Witch King is in the eliminated pile. It's definitely not. If unplayable, cycle it instead. So we'll just cycle this card. That's actually one of the promos. Choosing between Elrond or Arwen is a hard one, but I'm definitely going to put out Elrond, I think. We are then going to cycle Legolas, so we can put that out. Uh, Elrond allows us to draw one card, so we're just going to keep drawing cards. We have the three hunters. Ooh, well, I just discarded <laughs> Legolas, but that allows you to send Legolas, Gimli, and Strider uh, to any of the battlegrounds, even if they don't match icons. Eh, that's okay. It's very, very specific, and I haven't gotten that to work before. Because now we have Elrond out, while in reserve, increase your carryover limit by one. So now our carryover limit is three instead of two. We're back to Saruman. He still doesn't have any useful actions in the cards he has out, so he'll just draw. Oh, we have the Barrow Whites. Now you can see here, this is a one to three. That can be placed on the path one through three, which means he could be placed on the path right now. However, in general, they're not going to place them on the path until they can conceivably win. With that barrel white, that's only one skull. See that? We already have one shield. They're never going to take into account what's in our hands. So we do not need to act optimally for the bot. The bot is going to be stronger than us because they don't have to cycle cards to play. You're going to see they're going to play a lot more cards. So how we combat that extra card drawn, extra card play is by having them play suboptimally, <laughs> right? And we actually get to kind of help make those choices. So the Barrow White says, if in reserve and the active path is four through nine, so we don't have to worry about it now, it's an active path of one. If they could conceivably win, I'd actually send this right to the path. But right now they can't conceivably win, so that'll just go into the reserve. The Frodo player is going to play out Gandalf the Grey in reserve. I know so far it's all been reserve. <laughs> we have our village militia here. Don't need that right now. We will cycle that. Uh, I promise you at some point we're going to be starting to put stuff on those battlegrounds, but so far we're all getting prepared. Our Witch King will go next. He's got three cards left. Oh, we have the Black Easterling. Now we can see here, this can go on the path one through three and five through nine. Now they have two skulls out so they can conceivably win that path. So I'm going to send the Black Easterling out onto the path. It says it's a Nazgul. It has plus one shield on Dol Gordur. When played, draw one card. So no matter what's going to draw a card, we're just going to take a card from here and put it into their draw stack. They're going to keep going. This black Easterling will start to attack the Gildor's camp. Right now it is one shield to one skull though. So we are winning because we win ties on the path. The Aragorn player will play Halberd. We will cycle the three hunters so that we can play this. This card states, if in reserve, you may use your action and cycle this card to take Strider or Aragorn from your deck into your hand. We also still have Arwen in our hand, which is kind of awesome. I have Arwen who can super help Aragorn, giving him an extra shield or an extra path shield as well, which is cool. The Sauron player will now do a move action. He does not have a useful action. He cannot pass yet. He has too many cards. He has three, but he can do a move. He's going to move the rightmost card that is both eligible and useful from reserve in this priority, first to the path or to a battleground. Sending this barrel white to Gildor's encampment will give them two skulls. They're going to start winning that combat. Right now it is two to one the shadow player. The hobbit deck will play Frodo Baggins discarding or cycling the riders of Rohan, but I'm going to place him directly out on the path because if I put him in my reserve, I can't move him to the path like the bots can. I'd have to wait till a future round to do that. 
I almost forgot to read you his ability. It says, if eliminated for any reason, including being forsaken, cycle this card instead. So he literally cannot be eliminated ever. <laughs> yeah, the Hobbit deck, when I was playing against the free people, was super annoyed. This means now we're back to winning the path. We've got two shields to two attack skulls. The Witch King still has three cards, so he has to continue to draw. And we have the Black Captain. Activate Minas Tirith or reactivate Minas Tirith if it's in the free people scoring area. If not possible, cycle this card. Interesting. This card I had to ask on BGG, and the only reason that they would activate Minas Tirith is if they could conceivably take it down. Looking at what's on the board and looking at Minas Tirith's three shields, there's no way they can take that down right now, so I'm just going to cycle that card. The Aragorn player will now use Halberd's ability. We are going to cycle this card to take Strider or Aragorn. I want to take Strider just because when Aragorn comes out, we lose Strider. So might as well use Strider, Strider if possible. So here it is. I'll put Strider into my hand and I will cycle Halberd. We're back to the Saruman player. We'll draw his next card and we have the Saruman Staff. If unplayable, which it's unplayable because Saruman is not out, eliminate this card and choose. And now we get to choose this, and then we don't have to make it best for the bots. We have to make it as best for us as possible. Either take the Saruman card from the draw deck or cycle pile into, ha into hand, or add one corruption. And I think I'm just going to add one corruption. But that means they now have one point to our zero. But this card has been eliminated. The Frodo player only has two cards in hand, so because of that, I can choose to pass. Remember that when we come back to my turn again, I could do an action if I'd like, unless everybody passes now, which would be good for us because we'd have won both the battleground and the path. So I think I am just going to pass for now and see what the bot players are going to do. This is a game where it's very beneficial to act last. So you want to pass when you can to see what the bot does, and then you can react to it. The Witch King player only has two cards left in his hand, so he has no useful actions. He could pass, so we'll follow that green arrow. It then asks, does any other player or bot have cards above the carryover limit? And the answer to that is no. We all either have two or less cards. Technically, the Strider deck could have three, but they still only have two. So then it moves down to move. He has no movements that could be helpful. So then he actually is going to play a random card. So based on this, I don't think he's going to be keeping any cards in general. He's not going to be keeping any cards in his deck from round to round. And by deck, I mean hand. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, we'll flip our next one. Oh, we have a Nazgul. Okay, this is going to get interesting. So this Nazgul, he cannot go onto the battleground, which is fine because we first look at the path. He has a skull. That would mean they could take the path. So that's where he's going to send this. He's going to send the warrior there. This card can be played or moved to any shadow battleground. This means he's now winning the path three skulls to my two shields. Our Aragorn and Elf deck only has Strider in hand that could conceivably go on the path, but you can see it's only paths two through six, so he can't help right now, so I think I'm going to pass. Saruman will continue delving through his deck. He's got the Coastal Raiders. With that Coastal Raider and the Black Serpent now, they could attack Dal Amroth with two attack. That would still have them loose. So he's not going to send it to the battleground, can't send it to the path itself, it's going to go into reserve. It does have an action that if it, if it is in reserve, it can use its action to activate Dal Amroth, which is hilarious because it's already out, <laughs> so that won't happen. We're now back to the Frodo player, and I do think we're going to play Herbs and Stewed Rabbit for Frodo. And we have to cycle then Narya, which hurts a little bit. Oh man, I really wanted to do that with Gandalf, make them only have two cards next round. But I guess I'm gonna have to deal with it. If in play, you may well, and we'll we'll be able to do this next next turn. But this card states: if in play, you may use your action and eliminate this card to take a Hobbit character. We've got Sam from your cycle pile into your hand, and then draw a card. What's great about that is that draw a card allows us to play that Hobbit. I do want to mention that if ever you have one card in your hand, you can choose to forsake the top card of your deck but you don't know what it is. It could be Gandalf the White, which actually if it was Gandalf the White, it'd be great because he can't be eliminated that way. But it could be something else that you really need uh, and it's gone forever, but you can always pay by forsaking and eliminating that top card of your deck to play the last card in your hand. Our Witch King will draw their final card that they have here and they have Grishnach. Okay, this can only be placed 
on the path six or seven. If in reserve, move this card to the path, even if it's not useful. So that means that he would go to the path at six or seven, no matter what. He's just going to sit in the reserve until then, and he will move to the path. The Aragorn deck will pass. We'll then go to the Saruman deck, and they have the Goblins of the Misty Mountains. These are monstrosity armies, can't be placed anywhere, so that will simply be put into the reserve. This means our Frodo player will activate Herbs and Stewed Rabbit. If in play, you may use your action and eliminate this card to take a Hobbit character. And we've got Sam. We're going to put Sam into our hand, as well as the top card of the deck, which is Entdraught. Everyone else will then have to pass. We'll go back to the Frodo player. We're going to play Sam, but we're going to play Sam in the reserve because of his ability. And of course, that Ent Draught or Draft, we will use and cycle that card to be able to play that. His ability is pretty awesome. If in reserve, you may use your action and cycle this card along with any wielded items to add one of the shields, and you can add that to the active path itself. So after everyone passes yet again, we will then cycle Sam to place this on the active path. This will mean we have three shields, which is perfect. So now the Witch King has to pass, the Aragorn deck will pass, Saruman deck will pass, and Frodo will pass. We've all now passed. Now we can resolve combat. No one went to Dal Amroth, so we'll take this one as one victory point for us. The path here will be a tie, one, two, three shields to one, two, three skulls. That means we win the path as well because we're the defenders. Normally, that would mean Frodo would be eliminated, but because of his ability, he will simply be cycled. And so I didn't even lose a character for that. And they're going to lose all three of these characters uh, will be eliminated because they attacked the path and we still gained the one victory point. After combat, we'll move to the draw step. Everyone will draw three cards, except for Strider will draw four and then cycle one. That means we'll move three cards over here and three cards for the Witch King. The Hobbit deck ended up using all of their cards, so they're just going to draw three. We've got Treebeard. Oh, I love Treebeard. We have Gimli, the most useless card in the game. <laughs> and we have There is Another Way. That is a cool one. Uh, we're going to want to save that, though, for... Well, actually, I have an idea. I have an idea. There's Another Way is a really cool one. The Aragorn deck kept two cards in hand, and he gets to draw four. So he's got the Bow of Galadrim. Uh, we've got the High Elves. We have Faramir, which isn't super helpful except for in Path 7. And Path of the Dead. Oh, that's actually a really good one. I'm going to then cycle the Bow. Uh, well, actually, an, an Elf can use that. I think I'm going to cycle Faramir, hoping that I can get him to come back when we're closer to path 7. For anyone keeping track, the score is 2 to 1. I forgot they do have that one corruption uh, because of the staff of Saruman. So it's 2 to 1. Uh, we're winning, which is good because remember, we have to win. We can't tie. They can tie and they'll win. The Witch King will now be the start player, which means they'll be the ones that activate a shadow battleground and we'll have the level 2 path cards. We'll start by flipping the battleground, and we have Minas Morgul. A long tilted valley, a deep gulf of shadow ran back far into the mountains. Upon the further side, some way within the valley's arms, high on rocky seats upon Efel Duath, stood the walls and towers of Minas Morgul. All was dark about it, earth and sky, but it was lit with light. Not the light welling through the marble walls of Minas Ithil long ago, far and radiant in the hollow of the hills. Paler indeed than the moon ailing in some slow eclipse was the light of it now, wavering and blowing like a noisome exhilaration of decay, a corpse light, a light that illuminated nothing. Minas Morgul was once a fortress of Gondor, initially called a Minas Ithil, or Tower of the Moon. As the easternmost fortification in the kingdom of Gundor, Minas Ithils safeguarded the eastern borders of the realm and protected the capital Osgiliath from the forces of Mordor during the early part of the Third Age. As Gundor's power weakened, it was then taken by the forces of Mordor and used as a base to attack Gundor and in the process decayed into the Dark Fortress and was renamed as a result. This card states, the Mordor player draws up to five cards one at a time, play the first Nazgul character drawn to reserve, and then stop and cycle any of the unplayed cards. We'll start drawing from the deck, and that is an army, one, so that's not a Nazgul. That is an item for a Nazgul, but not a Nazgul, two. And number three, that is a Nazgul. So we'll have the commander set in reserve. 
This battleground is worth two points. The highest valued point battleground is Minas Tirith. If we win Minas Tirith, I'll feel pretty good. Although I have lost and had Minas Tirith. Uh, but two points, that's pretty good. Uh, we would have to attack with Gondorian or Wizards. So I could send Gandalf the Grey here with two attack and I have Strider. Yeah, so I have a way to maybe take this on if I want. It starts with two shields. We have to remember the Mordor Orcs are here that can add defense because you can see any of the Orcs will be able to defend that. Now, something else I want to mention about the paths. You're going to see that all of the odd-numbered paths will generally help the free people. All the even-numbered paths are going to help the uh, shadow player. The exception is 8 and 9. You would think, <laughs> obviously, 9 being an odd number, it's not going to be nice to us. So 8 and 9, those path cards are both good for the shadow player. Okay, let's grab these, give them a quick shuffle, and we'll pick this one. We have Weathertop. Weathertop, or Weathertop Hill, was the southernmost and highest of the weather hills in Eriador. It stood a little way from the other hills, and its conical top was flattened. Of old, it formed the boundary between Arthedain and Rudar, and upon it was the Tower of Amun Sol, overlooking the east-west road. Weathertop Summit was almost always windy due to its prominence. As represented in the Atlas of Middle-earth, Weathertop rose a thousand feet compared to the relative level of the surrounding lands and offered a commanding view in every direction. A path led from Weathertop northward to the other weather hills. This path card is certainly not as nice as the first one. <laughs> We're running with Strider, hopefully. There's no shields. You can see here there's a two. That means we could get two points if we complete that one. The ability here is the Mordor player will draw two cards. So remember how they had a hand of three? They now have the hand of five. And yeah, that's why I wanted the ring for Gandalf. That is what it is. I do also want to mention something. These coastal raiders that are currently in the reserve, their ability now, they'll never be able to use because no longer is Dal Amroth in the battleground deck. We now control it. It is in our scoring pile, so that action will never be used. Currently at Weathertop, we do not have any shields, but also the shadow player doesn't have any of the skulls, so technically we're still winning Weathertop right now. So you would think, hey, this commander with that uh, skull would probably want to jump on to the Weathertop and start trying to take control of that, but no. They always want to do actions first. And remember, they don't play smart. They play with however the flowchart works. And this is a useful action. If the action was not useful, then we wouldn't do it. But this action states here, if in reserve, use an action. And remember, we're starting with the Witch King. They're the first player now. Use an action to cycle this card, and each shadow player draws one card. So yeah, I mean, it's uh, still stinky, but they won't be adding one skull to the path right now. However, both shadow players now will have another card they're going to play. The Aragorn deck will start by playing Strider, and we're going to play Strider in reserve. Now you're going to see I'm tapping him slightly. That's to remind myself that, hey, he, I cannot now move him to add the battlegrounds or the path because I've played him in the reserve. I could with Elrond or Galadriel if they would work. They don't work on either of them, so I can't do that. Uh, Strider, I'm not able to now since I'm putting him in the reserve. I'm going to pay the Bow of Galadrim uh, to be able to put him out in reserve. Saruman will activate next. We'll flip his card. He's got the Balrog of Moria. Okay, unfortunately, he can't go anywhere. Path 4-5, so he will just be in the reserve. But when he comes out, <laughs> if he's put on a battleground or a path, he's going to cause us to forsake cards. Our Frodo player then will be taking Gandalf the Grey, and we're going to commit him to the path. We can do that because last round we put him in reserve, so we can move him as our action. We now have three shields at Weathertop. Bring it on. <laughs> How thematic is that, right? Gandalf is there at Weathertop. He also has a sweet ability that I hope I'll be able to activate next turn. The Witch King has no useful actions they can take on the cards out, so they will draw their next one. They have Mordor Orcs, which they could technically put at the battleground, but they're already winning, so they're not going to do that. They're just going to simply put it in reserve. You just got to play Arwen right after you play Strider, especially if you have her in her hand, right? <laughs> We're going to cycle the High Elves to be able to place out Arwen. We then get to draw one card, and we have the Knights of Del Amroth. Uh, and we will now have, for Strider or Aragorn, they'll have plus one shield for either if they're on the path or if they are at a battleground. The Saruman player will draw the next card, and we have the White Hand Orcs 
no place to put them, so they'll go in reserve. This means our free People's Player will activate Gandalf the Grey. If on a path, you may use your action to activate a path of the next higher number. So if we do that, that means we have to resolve combat at this specific location. We are currently defending at 3 to 0, which means we are winning. And since we're winning and nothing is attacking here, Gandalf the Grey doesn't even have to be eliminated. He will just go into our cycle pile. However, I doubt I'll see him again because if I get Gandalf the White, I'm playing Gandalf the White. But we'll throw him in our cycled pile. We just gained two victory points and we're pushing the game moving to the third path card. And don't forget the third level path cards are nicer to the free people. We have our three path cards. Let's go ahead and pick this one. And that's the Fords of Bruinen. At the beginning of the War of the Ring, Frodo Baggins, astride Glorfindel's horse, Asphaloth, was pursued by the Nazgul to the Ford of Bruinen. At the Ford, Frodo, poisoned by a deadly wound, made his stand and defied the Witch King of Agmar. This lured the ring race into the Bruinen, prompting Elrond to command a great flood from far away. Gandalf, who had arrived in Rivendell, caused the waters to take the form of rushing horses. This flood killed the steeds of the ring race, which led them to later make the use of the winged fell beasts. In the movie, it was Arwen, which I can understand, because why bring in Glorfindel when you don't know that character from Adam? Otherwise, <laughs> he's not used in the rest of the story, so it made sense. I absolutely love that scene in the movie. Oh, it's so cool. All right, this one is worth one victory point. We have no shields. We're still winning it right now. Each free people player may forsake, oh, actually must forsake one card, then each draw three cards. Oh, so we have to forsake to draw three. Well, Gimli, it was nice knowing you. We will definitely forsake Gimli and we'll draw three cards. We drew Merry, Gwahir, and Eomer. For our Dunedain player, I think we will lose the Knights of Del Amroth. I like to keep the Paths of the Undead because it can be super powerful. And we'll draw three cards. We have Aragorn, we have the Elven Cloak, and the File of Galadriel. We're now up four to one on victory points. Moving back to the Witch King. He has Trolls of Anduin. They could defend, but once again, we're not attacking it because I think I'm just going to give them Minas Morgul. So that will just go into their reserve. I'd like to continue to win the path as much as possible, so I do think I'm going to play out the Elven Cloak. I'm going to cycle the File of Galandriel uh, because Frodo and Sam have both been used. They're in the cycle pile, so I won't see them for a bit. This Elven Cloak can be put on a Hobbit or an Elf. It says, if the wielder is eliminated during path combat, cycle it instead along with any wielded items. I'm putting that on to Elrond because Elrond can actually move to path card three, which is what we're at. Now that will take an action, so I'll wait until later to do that. Saruman has two cards left, but no good actions to use, so he'll just keep drawing. He has Saruman. While in reserve, draw one additional card card each draw step great he would love to go to the path and take that path from us with two skulls but it has to be five to six we're at three so he'll just go into reserve should we have a little bit of fun i think so we're going to play the hobbit event there's another way we're gonna cycle aylmer because right now i don't need any rohirrim i'm sure i will later <laughs> and they'll be in the cycle pile oh well activate a different path of the same number as the active path and then add a shield to it this is an event card, so after we play it, it gets removed from the game. When we activate a different path, guess what? We resolve combat on this path, and it looks to be a 0-0, zero to zero, which means we win. That's another victory point for us. I'm also realizing, whenever you change the path during the round, if you're doing that and it doesn't say random, you get to pick. So I should have been able to pick that last one. Oh well, I'm picking this one, the Council of Elrond. The visitors to Rivendell assemble to discuss the matter of the One Ring. Each, in turn, tells news of their lands, recent events, and the reasons that had brought them to Rivendell. Finally, Frodo reveals the One Ring and its accompanying doom. Gandalf describes the capture of Gollum and his own imprisonment at Orthanc. A decision is made to take the One Ring to Mordor, where it must be destroyed. Frodo volunteers to carry the ring there, and when Sam objects to him going alone, he's drafted to accompany. We now get to have each Free People's player draw a card, and we have Soldiers of Gundor and Gandalf the White. We're killing it right now. We are killing it. It won't last. <laughs> We have the Nazgul Mantle. Choose one. Take one random Nazgul from the eliminated pile and play it. Oh, 
or draw two cards. You know what? I think I'm going to grab from the random Nazgul's here. These are the two that were eliminated. We're just going to shuffle them up and we're going to randomly choose this one and it's going to be played. This one says this card can be played or moved to any shadow battleground. Right now they do have one skull, but that's not enough to take the Council of Elrond. They need three total skulls before they're going to start committing there. So that's why the warrior is just going to sit here in the reserve. The Aragorn deck only has three cards in hand, and remember, his carryover limit is one higher, so I think we're just going to pass. There's only one card left for the Saruman deck, and we have Woven of All Colors. Choose one. Take Saruman from the eliminated pile. No, he's not. He's out. Add one Corruption, or Forsake two cards to add two Corruption. Okay, if I Forsaked two cards, it's always taking from the right-hand side of the reserve, that would get rid of Saruman and the White Hand. Now, they don't get eliminated for the bot players. Whenever they Forsake, they're just going to cycle. But I do really like the idea of cycling Saruman. I know I'm giving them two points for this, but I think it's worth it. They will cycle these two cards, gaining two Corruption. That gives them a total of three points. The Ferdo deck will play Gwahir and will cycle Treebeard. I know that kind of hurts a little bit. I love Treebeard but Gwahir's ability is just too good. The Witch King still has plenty of cards to play. He's got his Mordor Orcs though, that won't do anything, they'll just go into reserve. We'll then all pass going back to the Witch King. They currently are not winning the path, so they're going to continue to draw. If they are winning the path, they might pass. Oh, they have the Destroyer. This is a Nazgul, he can go to the path. Uh, this card can be played or moved to any free people's battleground. Oh, interesting. The Witch King has two skulls ready to go to the path. However, we have two shields there, so it's not enough for them to be able to take it over, so it's not useful for them to move there. So they're just going to stay here. We'll all pass again, and we have the Ring Race are ab abroad. Oh no! <laughs> Drop to seven cards one at a time. Play the first two Nazgul characters drawn, uh, and then stop. What? That's amazing. So that's not one. One two that is so we're gonna play that one <laughs> that's the witch king uh that's three no four no that's not a nazgul five that is a nazgul so we found our two nazguls we will cycle the rest of these and discard or eliminate the ring race abroad if the shadow player places both of these nazgul onto the path they will actually win it so they are going to do that looking at the chart we can see when they play a random card they'll First, do it to a path before a battleground, and that's only if they can conceivably win, which now they can. Which, for us, is actually not a terrible thing. <laughs> because what we can do is bring in Elrond. <laughs> Who doesn't love Elrond? This will mean our carryover limit will be reduced, so we're going to have to play a card before we end this round, or at least cycle one, if nothing else. But looking here, we added three more shields, so one, two, three, four, five, to three. Can they do anything about that? Looking at the cards that they have in reserve, they can get up to five skulls, but they can't get to six. So that means they will not try and move those over there to try and take that location. Thank you, Elrond. Unfortunately now, I can't keep all three of these cards in hand. I would love to keep the soldiers. I'm worried about when <laughs> a Ministereth comes out. You can see all of the armies ready to take it on. Uh, but the path is of the dead. I have to forsake two cards, though, to play that. So I think I am going to cycle the Soldiers of Gundor. I'm not going to play anything. I'm just going to cycle. So I have these two cards left in hand. We've all now claimed end of round. Minas Morgul will be controlled by the Shadow Player. That will get them to a total of five victory points. The path, we do protect it. Uh, with the Witch King and the Beguiler, they will be eliminated. They will then technically elim eliminate Elrond because we would need his shields, but he had his Elven Cloak, so that means we'll just cycle both of these instead, and we gain one victory point. As much as I have been feeling like we have been in control of this game, <laughs> the score is 6 to 5. We have 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and they have 5, thanks to that extra 2 corruption. I don't know if that was worth it, but ah, it is what it is. That's what we did. So it's six to five, nice and close. We'll now all draw. And as you can see, they are definitely ready to take on Minas Tirith, uh, any of those high point battlegrounds. Our Frodo player drew a Theoden, Gandalf's staff, and the most useless card, Dwarven Axe. Great for cycling to play other cards. 
For the Aragorn deck, we get to draw four cards. We have Nenya, we have Boromir, we have the Red Arrow, and we have the Blade of Westernese. And I have to cycle one. I think I'm going to cycle the Blade of Westernese. I think that's the right option. <laughs> we'll see. And of course, I ready everything, so now we could have Strider go to a path card. The first player for our next round will be the Aragorn deck. That means we'll be drawing a free People's Battleground and a number four path card. We'll flip over that top battleground, and we have Rivendell. Rivendell, or Imladris, is an elven outpost in the Misty Mountains on the eastern edge of Eriador. Due to its location, it was called the Last Homely House from the point of view of a traveler going to the Misty Mountains and Wilderland, and also the first homely house from the point of view of someone coming from these lands to the civilized lands of Eriador to the west. The elf player draws one card, then cycles one card from hand. We've drawn the Mirror of Galadriel. Ooh. And I think I'll cycle the Red Arrow card because this location, we can't even put the Gondorians here. We'll pick up our number four pass, give them a shuffle up, and we'll draw this one. And we have the Doors of Durin. The Doors of Durin, or Westgate, were built in the dark cliffs of the Silver Tyne Mountain and protected the entrance to what became the Goblin Realm of Moria, once the Dwarf Kingdom of Khazad-dûm. The doors were bordered on each side by two ancient holly trees symbolizing the border of the elven realm of Eryagon and Holland. The doors were notable for being inlaid with Ethildin, which only reflected starlight or moonlight. And of course, you needed to speak friend to enter. <laughs> this card is somewhat ridiculous and you'll see why in a second, but the monstrous player forsakes one card to add one corruption to this path. I will take that any day and you'll see why. I almost feel like it's unfair. We have the Belrog right here and that's one they have to forsake because they always take the rightmost. They're not going to do the smartest choice. Plus, they have to actually do this, so they have to forsake a card. They're going to forsake the Balrog, which could have added three skulls. Well, two, because that's not cause of doom. Two skulls for one. Um, yeah, I think I'll take that. Oh, and I used the wrong skull. So whenever you're adding skulls, uh, not adding actual corruption, you use the red tokens. So I'll put that red token on the doors of Durin. The Aragorn player is going to start the round by moving Strider to the doors of Durin. Normally, this is only two shields, but we have Arwen in our reserve. So that means he has three shields. He's thinking of her. We're at three to one. I love it. Saruman does have the Goblins of the Misty Mountains, but they only have one attack. So can't take out Rivendell yet. So we'll leave it in the reserve and just draw their next card. We have Ugluk. Okay, he would go to path five or six. So he can't go to the path anyways. If in reserve, move this card to, a, to pa a path six, even if the shadow is winning. If on a path, use an action to activate a different random path of the same number. The Frodo player then will use Gwahir the Windlord. If in reserve, you may use your action and cycle this card to take Gandalf the Grey from your cycle pile into your hand. Yeah, you remember how I said I wasn't going to use Gandalf the Grey? I think I might. Uh, let's see if I can find him. I swear I put him in here. Here he is. I'm going to put him back into our hand. So we actually have Gandalf the Grey and White in our hand, but Gwahir will be cycled. For the Witch King, we've got a couple skulls out, but they cannot go to the Path 4 card. And so because of that, we'll simply draw his first card. He will draw this one. It is the Mouth of Sauron. This can only be put on the path at 7 through 9. This card cannot be played or moved to a path if a shadow battleground is active. While this is in reserve, he's going to draw one additional card, and this will move to the reserve. We're back to the Aragorn player. We're going to activate Strider. If on a path, you may use your action to activate a path of the next higher number. Yeah, we're definitely going to do that. We're going to go to five. That means we are going to resolve combat, which does mean Strider is going to be eliminated here because we do have one skull. We have no shields on the location. So Strider will take a damage, which means he's gone. But don't worry, I've got Aragorn with me. <laughs> uh, that's only his second eliminated card. And the nice thing is the doors of Durin are ours. We're going to draw a path five card. We're going to activate Dimril Dale. Dimrildale was a valley on the east side of the Misty Mountains, beneath the Redhorn, Silvertine, and Cloudy Head Peaks. It was the eastern end of Redhorn Pass and was bordered by Dimril Stair. Dimrildale was the source of the Silver Lode River. At its southeast corner was Miramir, a sacred lake to the dwarves of the Durin folk. 
This card is just great. Each shadow player must cycle two cards from hand, while our uh, Sauron player, or the Witch King, only has two. So he's going to cycle both of those. Actually, both of them only have two. <laughs> Cycled both of them. Their hands are dry. If we look at this chart, we cannot use an action for the Saruman player. We can move to the can the bot pass? Yes, they can. Is any other player or bot above the carryover limit? Yes, there are people above the carryover limit. Is the path number below the scenario's max? Yes, it is. Is the shadow winning every combat? Currently, he's losing both. So no, then we're going to move to move if we can, and I can move. Ugluk. Ugluk was going to move to the uh, path because that gives them one skull and they'll start winning at Dimraldale. This will mean, though, the ability that he has for the uh, six path card won't happen. The Hobbit player will play Gandalf the Grey cycling the Dwarven Axe to do this because who needs that axe? We just got rid of uh, uh, Gimli anyways. <laughs> and we're going to put him on the path, which gives us three shields for the path. This means now we are winning 3 to 1 on this path card. The Witch King could send up to two more skulls, but that's not going to do anything for him. That would make him tie Gandalf the Great, so he's not going to send them. There's no other actions here that are useful right now, so he's going to pass. The Aragorn player is going to drop Aragorn down on the table in the reserve. It says, when played, remove Strider from the game. He's already removed. While in reserve, draw one additional card each draw step. So now we're going to draw five cards, cycling one. We do have to pay for this, and I'm going to get rid of the Mirror of Galadriel. I love it, but I just can't afford everything. <laughs> Do you remember Gandalf the Grey's ability? Yeah, he can activate a path of the next higher number. Now, we will have to resolve combat. That will mean Gandalf the Grey is eliminated, but that's okay. We have Gandalf the White in our hand. So this is eliminated. Ugluk is eliminated. We just earned another one victory point. And we're going to move to path card six already. None of the path six cards are great for us. So this is the one that's the least worst, I think. Amon Hen. The hill stood above the western banks of the Anduin, and was one of the three peaks at the southern end of the long lake Nen Hithoel, above the falls of Rarus, the other two hills being Amund Law and Tal Brandir. At the hill's eastern foot lay the lawn of Parth Galen, adjacent to the Anduin. The seat of the scene was built at the summit of Amon Hen, close to the earlier northern borders of Gondor, where it long served as a watchtower. The Mordor player gets to draw one card. That's definitely better than the other ones, so we'll just have one card drawn for the Mordor player. Speaking of Mordor, the Witch King is going to activate next, and he has an, a use ability that he's definitely going to use. That is Grishnach. This says, if in reserve, move this card onto the path even if it's not useful. If on the path, use an action, eliminate this card, and choose add two skulls to that path, or just add a corruption. Remember, we get to choose that ability, which one we want. He would go at six or seven. Looking at the cards I have remaining, this is an incredibly tough choice. What I could do, and maybe I should just do this. You know, I think I'm going to do it. No, I can't. Ah, oh, I'd have to forsake a card. I, I keep holding on to Path of the Dead for when we uh, do the big fight in one of the, uh, <laughs> like, Minas Tirith or Helm's Deep. Oh, man. But I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to cycle Boromir. I'm going to cycle Boromir so I can put out uh, Nenya, the Ring of Adamant, onto Galadriel. And it says, if in reserve you may use your action and cycle this card to add a shield to either the active path or a shield to the battleground. I then think I'll cycle Theoden so I can put out Gandalf the White. I'm going to put him in the reserve so I'll have him exhausted. He says, when played, remove Gandalf the Grey from the game. He has been removed. While in reserve, draw one additional card each draw step. If the Forsaken, you get to uh, immediately put him in the cycle, so he can't be Forsaken from the top of your deck. The Witch King will eliminate Grishnach and place two skulls. I think that's what I'm going to do. Place two skulls on this current location, or path, I should say. So if I don't do anything here, they're going to score two points with that at the end of the game. Aragorn will then have Galadriel activate Nenya. If in reserve, you may use your action and cycle this card. So it's only talking about the card itself, not the wielder herself. We're going to cycle this and put a shield onto the path. That means right now it's two to one. No matter what we do on the Hobbit side, the Witch King will be able to take the path this time. I don't think there's anything we can do there. So I'm going to prepare Gandalf the White. I'm going to use Mary Brandybook. 
I love him, but I'm going to use him so I can play the Gandalf Staff. Now, my carryover limit is increased by one. I don't have any cards. That doesn't matter. What really matters are these three symbols. So now you're talking to me. I could, well, I can't go on the path, so that one's useless. But now I've got three attack and four shields with Gandalf the White. Yeah, he's all primed and ready for Minas Tirith. The Witch King does have one more card in hand, so let's flip that and see what it is. No, the day without dawn. Drop to seven cards, one at a time. Play the first two armies drawn. Oh my gosh, first two armies. One, that is an event. Two, that's an army. It's just a regular army. Three, uh, that is an army. There's our two armies. Wow. Well, they are going to be ready. We'll shuffle this one into the cycle. This will be removed. Uh, but they're going to be ready for Minas Tirith too. Look at this absolutely insane army. I love this in a way because this feels exactly like the story. We know Saruman and the Witch King are getting all of their troops to get together ready to take us down. We will end this round. We claim Rivendell, so that gives us two points and the bots only are going to claim one point uh, because we do have that one shield. Because Gandalf the White is in our reserve, the Frodo deck gets to draw four cards. We have Pippin. Pippin's my favorite. We have Quick Beam. That's two. And by the way, we have no cards in hand. We have Sting. Who Sting could go with Pippin. And we have the Riders of Rohan. Aragorn has Galadriel and Aragorn, so we can draw five cards. We have Lembus Bread. One, two, Prince Imrahel. Three, we've got um, Vilya. Uh, and then we have the Dead Men of Dunharrow. And one more, we have the Guards of the Citadel. And then we get to cycle one card. Uh, or get to, we have to. I'm definitely going to cycle Vilya because Elrond is in the cycle pile. Now, once that deck is empty, that means we take our cycle deck, our cycle pile, and shuffle it up and it becomes our deck. For anyone keeping score, we're up 11 to 6. Sounds like we're doing pretty well, but you got to remember, they are not over committing to any of those path cards until they get to the level 9 ones. Then they're just going to load on those skulls, trying to get a bunch of points. That's how I've lost is usually at the, the end of the game. And I will say, when I've played this competitively, it's always how it's happened. The free people start off with a lead, and then the shadow player comes back. I've drawn up our cards for the bots. We have three for the Saruman player and four for the Witch King player because they have the Mouth of Sauron sitting here, adding plus one to their draw. Because Saruman will be at first player, we have a shadow location. We have Umbar. Each shadow player draws a card. Well, never mind. We have five for the Mordor player and four for Saruman. The Haven of Umbar was a city to the far south of Gondor in Middle-earth, where the king's men and their descendants lived in a city of the same name. By the Third Age, known for its seafaring corsairs, the great cape and landlocked firth of Umbar south of the Bay of Belphalas formed a natural harbor of an enclosing rock, but the greatest fortress of Numenor located within it was not built until 2280. It was only by this time that Sauron had dared to threaten Numenor. The strength of his terror and mastery over men had grown exceedingly great. He began to assail the strong places of the Numenorians upon the shores of the sea. I wonder if we're going to see more of this in The Power of the Ring, the Amazon show. I'm hoping that we do. This path card number seven will be our last nice one to us. The final two are going to be mean. So let's flip this one. We have Osgiliath. Osgiliath was the old capital city of Gundor. The city stood on both sides of the river Anduin, at the point approximately halfway between the cities of Minas Anor to the southwest and Minas Ithil to the northeast, and north of the nearby Emin Arnon. In the great hall of the city, the thrones of the sons of Elendil were set side by side. In its days of glory, the city featured caves to handle sea-going vessels that came up from the sea, a great stone bridge supporting houses and towers of stone, and the Dome of Stars which housed the Osgiliath Stone, the greatest of the seven Palantiri. This is where I wish I had Faramir in my hand. The Duna 9 player may forsake one card to draw three cards. Oh, maybe we can get one. I think Lembus is a pretty cool card, but we only have one Hobbit in our hand, so I think I'm going to lose this card, eliminate it, so I can draw three cards. Faramir might be in these three. We've got the Nenya Ring. Oh, we can put that on Galadriel again. We have Denethor. We can help us find Faramir, actually. And we have Legolas. Our Saruman deck is the first player. We'll draw their first card, and they have Grima. If in reserve, as an action, eliminate this card and choose. Take Saruman from the draw deck into hand. 
Eliminate a Rohan character in play or draw two cards. Oh, those are all nasty. He can't go anywhere. Let's see, five, six. No, we're on past seven. Yeah, so he'll go in the reserve. Next action, that's what they're going to be doing. Our Frodo player will start by playing out Pippin. We'll give up Quick Beam to do this. That will be cycled. And we're going to place Pippin right on the path. This may be, he may be played or moved to a Dunedain battleground. There's two points to be had out here on the board, so not a ton, but I don't really want the Shadow player to get both. I'm seeing if maybe I can take this one. Looking at all of the cards in reserve for the Witch King, he certainly can take this location or this path card. We've got a seven, seven, seven. So we've got three of these. So uh, he always starts with the farthest right, even if it doesn't make sense. The Mouth of Sauron is going to move to the path. This will make it a one-to-one -one tie. The Aragorn player is going to put out Denethor, and he's going to give up Prince Imrahil, putting him into our cycle pile. This says, if in reserve you may use your action and forsake one card to take Boromir or Faramir from your draw deck into your hand. For the Saruman player, we're going to activate Grima, and I think we're just going to have him draw two cards. Just two cards. Maybe they won't be terrible. Uh, but then he's going to be eliminated, which is wonderful. Blasted Grima. The Frodo deck will then just get Sting out, discarding the Riders of Rohan, so we'll put that onto Pippin. There are currently no monstrous enemies there, so we only have two shields right now. With our two shields, they still have enough skulls to take it over from us, so the Destroyer will be moved over to the path. We've got ourselves a fight over here, two to two. We're now going to use Denethor's ability. You may use your action and forsake one card to take, and we're going to do Faramir from your draw deck into your hand. We are going to forsake Denethor himself. I don't want him. <laughs> uh, he is going to kill himself, as we know what happens, and Gandalf the White, who is over here, is going to save Faramir. I'm hoping we can play him at the right time to tie up the Path 7 card, and we immediately activate a different one, which is cool. It is going to depend, though, a lot on how what these uh, the bot players are going to do. Uh, this one, oh my gosh, look at three attack. Devilry of Saruman, can't put it anywhere yet, so we'll just put that in the reserve. Frodo will pass, which means the Witch King will send his next Nazgul out to the path and try and take us down. This means they are in the lead at three skulls to two shields. However, the Witch King played just into our hands. We are going to play Faramir, Cycling, Nenya. I just don't know what I'm doing. I don't know if that's a good idea. We're going to bring him to the path. That means we can immediately activate a different path seven. Definitely going to do that. We are tied three to three. That means we won that one. And that means all of these Nazgul have been destroyed. <laughs> and unfortunately, all of these are destroyed too, but totally worth it. And of course, what am I saying? Pippin doesn't get destroyed. If eliminated in path combat, cycle this card instead along with any wielded items. Like I was saying, those hobbits are annoying when you're playing as the shadow player. Oh, you just can't get rid of them. You lose Nazgul and they're like, oh, I'll just cycle those Pippin and Frodo and... <laughs> all right, we have the crossroads. The crossroads, also known as the Crossroads of the Fallen King, was where the Harad Road crossed the Morgul Road in Athelion. The crossroads were located some hundred miles south of the Black Gate and were roughly a day's ride from Minas Tirith. The location was surrounded by a great ring of trees, and nearby there was a statue built of an unknown former king of Gondor. The crossroads, along with the nearby statue, were presumably constructed by the men of Gondor in the Second Age. By the time of the War of the Ring, however, Gondor had relinquished effective control of the region, leading orcs to vandalize the statue. You can see here, each free people player draws a card. And that is a pretty awesome draw. We've got Glamdring and Andril. Saruman will draw his next card, and he has the Corsairs of Umbar. If in reserve, use an action and cycle this card to activate Umbar, but I think Umar's already activated. Ha! Huh. We have been kind of lucky on that, so that'll just go to the reserve. Our Frodo player is going to take a little bit of a chance. We want to play Glamdring onto Gandalf. We don't have any cards in hand, so we're just going to forsake or lose the top card of our deck to do that. It's a Mithril Coat. Oh, that's actually kind of a bummer. Look at that. That's two shields, but that is what it is. That's what you do. Uh, but now, if you look here, <laughs> we've got a staff, we have the sword, and we have Gandalf already. The Witch King only has armies out, so he's just going to keep drawing right now. Oh, we have Gothmog, and now he can come out because the Witch King has been destroyed. The Witch King cannot be, or this cannot be played unless the Witch King has been eliminated. It is certainly playable, and it will add one additional card on for draws going forward. 
Well, I might get kicked in the teeth for this later, but I'm going to play the Paths of the Dead. I need to forsake two cards. I think I'm going to lose Galadriel and Arwen. They're both awesome, but I think I'm going to give both of them up. Uh, that means Forsaken. They are eliminated from the game. That means Aragorn is a little bit weaker. I also have to pay for this card, so I'm going to discard Legolas. <laughs> But that means I get to draw five cards because I have Aragorn in the reserve. We drew the Great Gate, the Red Arrow, the Elven Cloak, the Bow of Galadrim, uh, three hunters, which is useless. I don't think that was worth it. Bummer. I was trying to get cute to get Minas Tirith out. I'm not sure that's going to be worth it. Oh, we have the Flocks of Serbane. Okay. If in reserve, it's not going to be in reserve because this can go to the path and that's where it's going to go because they will be winning the path. Fortunately, it will not use the if on path 2 through 6 because they're now on path 7. The shadow player is now winning this path card. Frodo still has no cards in hand, so we'll pass. We have the commander. Okay, this will go into the reserve because they're already winning the path right now. This card will allow them to draw more cards. The Aragorn player will play Andril, and we will give up the elven cloak and cycle it. This will be placed onto Aragorn. If in reserve, you may use your action to activate or reactivate any Dunedain battleground. That's any one that has the Dunedain symbol on it. Then you must move the wielder to that battleground. I'm still thinking of maybe doing that, activating Minas Tirith. We might have a big battle here. Saruman will flip his next card and he has threats and promises. Activate Helm's Deep. Oh, could they take on Helm's Deep? Oh, this could change everything. Helm's Deep only has two shields. They have the Devilry of Saruman out. That could take this out on its own. So yeah, they're going to activate this. This card then will be removed from the game because it's an event and it has been played. The gorge narrowed from the north, with the cliffs on each side heightening until its southernmost point, where the fortress of the Hornburg and the source of the deeping stream lay. The Hornburg was built upon a great spur of rock which extended from the gorge's northern cliff, and from the fortress to the southern cliff was built the deeping wall. The earthen wall known as Helm's Dyke spanned the width of the gorge, acting as a first defense of the fortress. Behind the Hornburg was located the glittering caves which were renowned for their beauty. The Rohan player draws five cards and from those may play one army or character on Helm's Deep and then cycles the rest. I had three cards left in my deck so I shuffled my cycled pile to get the last two. I actually only have one and it's Aramur. And it says when played, draw five cards from these, play up to one Rohan army and cycle the rest. Heck yeah. Right now, Aomer is not adding any shields to Helm's Deep unless he gets an army there. So we have to draw five cards. One, two, three, four, five, and hope one of these is a Rohan army. Oh, it looks like we've got one. This will be the one that works. The Rohan army will cycle the rest. This means we have a total shield value of four now at Helm's Deep. The Frodo player has no cards in hand, the poor guy, so we're just going to go right to the Witch King. He gets some Black Uruks, no place to put those. Oh my gosh, that's two more attack though. I'm thinking now it might not be a good idea to activate Helm's Deep. And by Helm's Deep, I mean Minas Tirith. Or do we just do it because that's awesome and thematic and we'll have Helm's Deep and Minas Tirith at the same time? I think that's okay. <laughs> Is that the best strategy? No, but we're going to do it. We're going to activate a Dunedain Battleground. We're going to bring out Minas Tirith. Aragorn is immediately going to go there. Minas Tirith was the capital of Gondor at the end of the Third Age of Middle-earth. It lay at the eastern end of the White Mountains, built around a shoulder of Mountain Mindolin. The city is sometimes called the White Tower, for the city's most prominent building is its citadel, the seat of the city's administration. Minas Tirith had seven walls. Each wall held a gate, and each gate faced a different direction from the next, facing alternatively somewhat north or south. Each level was about a hundred feet higher than the one below it, and each surrounded by a high stone wall colored in white, with the exception of the wall of the first circle, which was black, built of the same material used for Orthanc. This outer wall was also the tallest, longest, and strongest of the city's seven walls. <laughs> Can you imagine seeing that and trying to take that down? Yeah, I mean, even orcs were scared of that. We have here the Dunedain player may forsake one card to draw three cards. Yeah, we're definitely going to do that. And we're going to put Aragorn here. We'll forsake the three hunters. We drew the Blade of Westernies, the File of Galadriel, and Halbrad. And now the fun begins. Starting on the right-hand side, we definitely have enough 
over here between Saruman and the Witch King. We have 12 attack, I believe, compared to our 5 defense. That's it for now. The Corsair of Umbar is going to move to Minas Tirith. It's always the farthest right they're going to look at. They definitely can do that. This will mean right now it's 5 to 1. Frodo is going to pass for quite some time. All we have is Gandalf. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, Gandalf the White is pretty awesome. We just have to decide where we're going to put him. The Black Uruks are also going to go to Minas Tirith. This will make their attack value at 3. Remember hearing about that Great Gate? Let's put it out. We will use the Red Arrow to put this out. That will give us 3 more shields on Minas Tirith. This card cannot be played or moved to a Shadow Battleground. That is definitely okay by me. We've got 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 shields. We have the Devilry of Saruman, but that's only a 3 attack. Looking at Helm's Deep, they need 1, 2, 3, 4. They need at least 5 to be useful, so they're going to pass on these two. But this Corsair Raider, they still have enough attack that they're going to send this to Minas Tirith. I'm really hoping at the end of this we can maybe keep Gandalf the White in the reserve for Frodo, <laughs> but we'll see. I'm realizing I totally missed this on the commander. It says, if in reserve, use an action to cycle this card and each uh, shadow player draws a card. That they would check first if they have a useful action. So they are definitely going to cycle this. Probably should have done that earlier, but that's okay. Uh, then they'll each draw a card, but that means more unknowns. I'm not liking the unknowns. The Aragorn player will then play Halbred. We'll discard the Blade of Western East to do so. We're going to place him at Minas Tirith. It is now 1, 2, 3, 4 attack to 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 defense. Saruman, though, will then grab the Black Serpent, and he's going to play that to Minas Tirith. He can, and that will turn into an attack, because there is an army there that's going to support him of the same type. And this says, when this is played or moved to a battleground, each free people players must forsake one card. We're each going to forsake a card from the top of our deck. So the Aragorn deck is going to lose Boromir. Oh, and the Frodo deck is going to lose Shadowfax. Gothmog will then be moved to Minas Tirith. He will be supported by this army over here. So the attack does count. One, two, three, four, five, six. The Aragorn player will use the Bow of Galadrim to put out the Dead Men of Dunharrow. Two more shields. This is just starting to get crazy. The Saruman player has nothing else in the reserve that he wants to use, so he's going to flip his next card. Oh no, we have the Haradrim Cal Calvary. If in reserve, oh, this would pull out the Minas, Minas Tirith. No, this is just going to go right to Minas Tirith. And at this point, it's going to be hard for us to take this one. The Olagai is also going to come to Minas Tirith. The Aragorn player does have the Guards of the Citadel in hand, discarding the file of Galadriel. His hand is now empty. That will be two more shields at Minas Tirith. Oh my goodness, where are the Rohirrim? <laughs> they are dealing with Helm's Deep, apparently. This is the alternate universe where both are being attacked at the same time. We have for defense 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 defense to 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 attack. The Saruman player will flip the next card, and we have Karadras. When played or moved to Karadras, path activate a different path that won't happen it can't go to the path we're at path seven so it says if in reserve and the active path is six through nine use this action to eliminate this card and draw two so we're not done yet this will give them two more cards in just a second right now with what the witch king has in reserve that would get them to 14 attack that matches our defense so that means it's not useful to send any of these anymore they're going to just start drawing cards the problem is He's still got three cards, and we've got the Black Rider's Mount. Choose, add two skulls to a Nazgul on the path, forsake two cards to add one corruption, or draw two cards. Why don't we forsake two cards to add one corruption? Yeah, uh, because there is no Nazgul on the path, so we can't do that. We will forsake two of these army cards which actually will just go into the cycle pile based on how this these cards work if they're eliminated for any reason they get cycled oh my gosh uh but that does give them one corruption so that will give them another point thank you black riders mount i i do really like these cards where you get to make the decision it's really it's kind of fun to be able to pick your uh least worst poison Aragorn is passing. Saruman will eliminate this card to draw two more cards, and then we'll go back to the Mordor player. 
He'll draw his next card, and he has the Reaver. The Reaver states, if in reserve, use an action to cycle this card, and each free people's player must forsake one card. This will go into our reserve right now, because adding one attack will not be enough to take out Minas Tirith. We can't move him to Helm's Deep, or an Umbar they're winning. It's now back to Saruman. I feel like my fate is uh, oh, could be settled here quickly, but the Goblins of the Misty Mountains won't do anything. Right now, they're winning the path for one Corruption and Umbar for one. But we're gaining five, three from Minas Tirith and two from Helm's Deep. That's pretty good. Moving back to the Witch King, the Reaver will activate going into the cycle pile, and we're both going to forsake the top cards of our decks. We have for the Frodo player, the Riders of Rohan, and the Aragorn player will lose the High Elves. Saruman only has one card left. Oh, the Wolf Riders. Two plus three is five. That will be enough to take Helm's Deep, so they're going to move those Wolf Riders to Helm's Deep. With the two attack here, it is two to four. The Frodo player will pass yet again. This is the last card for the Witch King. Oh my gosh, Black Breath. Choose one. Add two skulls to the active path. Cycle one Nazgul from a path to add one corruption. Or forsake one card to add one corruption. Adding two skulls to the path is essentially getting two more corruption since I'm losing that, so I don't want to do that. I think we'll just have them forsake one card. That means they'll discard this Trolls of Anduin, or Udun, putting that in their cycle deck to gain another point. This is how they beat me. They sneak all these points. I get these epic wins, and then all of a sudden I look, and they have so much corruption, which is awesome in a way, that I end up losing. <laughs> Aragorn will continue to pass, so the Saruman player will use the Devilry of Saruman, and that will make it 5-4 to four at Helm's Deep, and I do think the Frodo player will bring in Gandalf the White. Oh, seems like such a waste. We have so many shields now, but that means we should protect Helm's Deep, so we have Helm's Deep and Minas Tirith. I think we're all done. There isn't anything else. They have no cards in hand. They're not going to bring out the Mordor Orcs because they're not going to win Minas Tirith. So yeah, I think we can now resolve everything. First things first, they will win the path. That gives them another corruption. And the big thing is, is we don't get that extra point, which is a bummer. Okay, we're going to have to figure out which cards we're going to lose here. So we have three shields from here. So that will negate one, two, three. Then we have to start losing things from these cards. So I've got one and one. That's two. We'll lose the dead men of Dunharrow. They're gone. Then we've got one attack here. I'm going to keep Aragorn and Andril if I can. So that was one, and this one will be one. And actually, you know what? I'll do one plus these two, so that's three. That means the Great Gate is gone. And then the Corsairs of Umbar will take out uh, Hellbred. Yeah, let's have it take out Hellbred. So that means these were extra. That means those get to cycle. All of these will be eliminated. That also means, though, we won Minas Tirith for now. <laughs> Next is Helm's Deep. So we've got two shields here that will block this. Then we've got three here. And as much as I don't like it, I think I'm going to have the three take, be taken from Gandalf. That way I can cycle these two in case I need more Rohirrim. I need to use at least one of Gandalf's shields, so might as well do it that way. I will lose Gandalf. I've now used both of my Gandalfs. Oh, it's a bummer. But we do have Helm's Deep. Lastly, though, Umbar is theirs. That will give them a point. After completing the seventh path card, the Shadow Player has three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten total points. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. So we're up by seven. And we both have not used our rings yet, so technically it's nine. However, we're drawing three cards each. I have Treebeard, I'll have Mary, and I will have the Riders of Rohan. The Aragorn deck will have High Elves. We will have the Soldiers of Gundor, all these basic people now. And Elrond, okay, Elrond's with us at least. Each of the Shadow players just drew three cards for their hand. We'll go back to Frodo being the first player, which means we will have a free people's location. We'll draw that top location, and we have Pelagrir. Pelagrir was built as a haven of the faithful for the king's men. It had in its early days been a city only a few miles away from the coast, but after the downfall of Numenor, the coast along the Bay of Belphalas had retreated a great distance and the city was left far inland. 
Pellegrir was one of the cities that assembled Gondor when it was founded by the faithful. The Dunedain player may forsake one card to draw one card. Yeah, let's do that. Let's go ahead and give up these high elves. I'm not sure if that's really worth it. And we're going to get the Mirror of Galadriel, which is way less worth it <laughs> because Galadriel is gone. Unfortunately, poor choices were made. That's okay. Now we're going to do the path card. We're going to pick this one. This is the Morgul Vale. The Morgul Vale was a valley in the FL Duath through which the Morgul Duin ran. The valley was guarded by Minas Morgul, Minas Ithil in years past. In the Vale, a stone bridge passed over the water meadows filled with sickly white flowers giving off a noxious vapor. The Mordor player draws up to five cards one at a time, play the first Nazgul character drawn, and then stop. So I'll just start going from here. Oh, we've got a Nazgul right here. Uh, this will start, actually, right now it's going to start here because they are now going to take the path. <laughs> oh boy, and with two skulls too. Frodo is our first player. We are going to put Mary Brandybuck here just to make it a two to one. We will give up Treebeard to do so, putting them in our cycle pile. And that means we only have one card left in our hand. This is going to be interesting. Where is Smeagol when you need him? <laughs> All right, this, oh my gosh, this is Grand. Grand can't go anywhere for the Witch King. That will just go into his support. Thank goodness that was not there uh, when we were having Ministereth out. The Aragorn deck will play Elrond by getting rid of the Mirror of Galadriel. Uh, that means he will also get to draw a card. That's the last card in his deck. Oh, it's Vilya. That's cool. Uh, and then we'll immediately shuffle our cycle deck to have it become our deck. Our deck now only has 12 cards left in it. Saruman will flip his first card, and he has Shelob. <laughs> uh, this has plus one skull uh, to the Shelob lair. If in reserve, move this card to path eight, even if the shadow is winning. Uh, so we'll be putting that onto uh, path card eight next turn. This will go into the reserve for now. The Hobbit player will pass, having only one card in hand. So the Witch King will play the Morgul Blade. This card can only be played to a wielder on a path. Yes, they can do that. If unplayable, no, it is definitely playable. So that's going to give them a third skull. Oh my goodness, the corruption is real. This is so cool. I love how this game is playing. They are fighting back with everything. They lost the battles, but now they're trying to take Frodo down. This is great. Aragorn will then simply use the soldiers of Gondor to place Vilya out on Elrond. Then we all know what's going to happen. Shelob is going to come here no matter what. If in reserve, move this card to path eight, even if the shadow is winning. We won't get the extra skull, thank goodness, but it's one, two, three, four to one. That's three points for them right now. The Witch King will be next, his last card. He's got the Black Captain. Activate Minas Tirith or reactivate Minas Tirith if it's in the free people's scoring area. No flipping way. They'll do that because they have a way to take it out with Grand here with that three attack. This is amazing. I literally just cycled my Gondorian card that I could have put here for defense as well. The Dunedain player does get the option of forsaking a card to be able to draw three cards. I'm going to forsake the top card of my deck. I'm going to lose Legolas. That's okay. It's okay. I'm going to draw three cards. I get the bow. Oh my gosh, it was right next to Legolas. I get Aragorn. You better believe it. I've got Nenya totally useless because Gladril's gone. That is amazing. Aragorn is with us though. Looking at Minas Tirith, though, even with Aragorn, it will fall because of Grand right now. So I still need to pull some tricks. I might need to use the ring, you guys. I might need to use the ring. Before using the one ring, let's use the Vilya ring. We will cycle this card so we can each draw one card. So we get the Elven Cloak, which is useless. Oh. And then the Frodo deck will grab Eowyn. Saruman still has tricks up his sleeve. He's got Gollum. If on the path, use an action to activate a different random path of the same number. If eliminated for any reason, cycle this card instead. Now, I don't believe he goes on to the path because they are winning. I think he will go into support. Once they get to nine, though, he will be doing that. I do want to mention one quick thing about reactivating battlegrounds that are in scoring areas. Let's say the shadow player had uh, won Minas Tirith. Now in this game, that card, he never would have reactivated it. But let's say in a competitive game, I could have reactivated Minas Tirith from their scoring pile. Uh, I would not have those three shields if I'm bringing it back from their scoring pile. But if it's from my scoring pile, I do keep those three shields. All right, 
they're going to bring Grand Hammer of the Underworld here. Aragorn will respond with the Nenya Ring so he can put himself out on to Minas Tirith as well. That means right now we are winning. We're up four to three. Saruman is going to play the Planther of Orthanc. Choose to draw two cards, forsake one card to add one corruption. We're going to forsake Gollum. Yes, put Gollum in the discard pile, and we're going to add one corruption. I don't want Gollum out when the level nine paths are coming. Thank goodness we'll just give them one point for that. Frodo will continue to pass. He's got two Rohirrim cards in his hand. Useless. This will mean now 3-4, three, 3-4, four, three, four, they're tied. Next time they'll bring the final Mordor orcs to take the lead. I told you I never do this, right? But I'm going to. I'm going to winnow. I'm going to eliminate these two cards in my hand for the Aragorn deck to draw one. Be Gondorian. Be Gondorian. Oh, it's the blade. Oh, that can only be on a Hobbit. Not worthwhile. Everyone else at this point is going to pass. Currently, we're scoring one point, but we're giving up three points here, and we're going to lose one, two, three more points here. So we're going to give them six points. I don't feel good about that. I'm going to have Aragorn use the ring. What are you doing, Aragorn? What are you doing? Uh, we get Andril. Andril will work for Aragorn, and we get the guards of the Citadel. Beautiful. Yeah, that was worth it. With these cards, then, we will give up the Blade of Westernese so we can put Andril on Aragorn. That will mean he is at 1, 2, and we've got 3, that's 5, and they're at 3, 4. That feels amazing. The Witch King will not send his final Mordor Orcs there because that will just mean that they'll tie us. 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so they won't do that. Instead, these Mordor Orcs will simply get cycled this one will be eliminated. I will lose Aragorn and Andril, but still worth it. These two are mine still. <laughs> Unfortunately, not this one. So Mary will fortunately go into our cycle pile. All these will be eliminated, but uh, we will take three corruption and give it to the shadow player. The score before our final round is 14 to 18. We do have one ring that's not used, so technically we're at 19. Can we survive? Let's see. We'll all draw up the final round. The Witch King will be first player. That means there's going to be a shadow battleground. Oh, I don't know. We'll each draw three cards. We've got Ent Draft for the Frodo player. Frodo Baggins, which is awesome. And the Dwarven Axe, 100% useless. We've got Prince Imrahel. Eh. We've got the Red Arrow also. Well, actually, that it depends upon the enemy location. The File of Galadriel. And we have Frodo. That can give us two shields. That actually is amazing. This is it. This is the final round. We're up by four to five points. The location is Orthanc. The Tower of Orthanc was composed of four welded pillars of many-sided stone that stood in the center of the Ring of Isengard like an island, roughly half a mile from the rim. At its peak, the tower reached a height of just over 500 feet. The color of the rock was a deep, gleaming black. At Orthanc's pinnacle, the four piers opened out to form four pinnacles of sharp rock. Between these aisles of rock, there was a narrow, polished floor on which many strange signs were written. There stood a tower of marvelous shape. It was fashioned by the builders of old who smoothed the ring of Isengard, and yet it seemed a thing not made by craft of men, but riven from the bones of the earth in the ancient torment of the hills. The Isengard player may take Saruman from the draw deck or cycle pile and put it into hand. Oh no. And then it says the Isengarn player will recycle their cycle pile, so that all becomes their deck. Our path card, these are all going to stink. Let's do this one. Oh, we have Orodruin. Mount Doom, also known as Orodruin, and Aman Amarth, was a volcano in Mordor where the One Ring was forged by the Dark Lord Sauron, and accordingly the only place in which it could be destroyed. Mount Doom was the result of works of the first Dark Lord, Melkor, in the First Age. In the Second Age, Sauron chose the land of Mordor as his dwelling place. He used the fire that welled there from the heart of the earth in his sorceries and his forging. Sauron forged the One Ring in the depths of the Crack of Doom, which was built within Mount Doom itself. Mount Doom erupted, signaling Sauron's attack on Gondor, where it earned its name Amon Amarth. This one states the Mordor player draws two cards, which is going to empty out their draw deck. I will shuffle their cycle deck. So they're going to have five cards to play this round, and they're starting it. 
They're going to draw that first card, and they have Gorbag and Shagrat. Oh my gosh, these guys thematically show up at the right time. Plus one at Kidith Ungol. Thank goodness that's not there. When played or moved to a path, forsake one card. Okay, they're going to forsake this card. It'll go into their cycle pile. That will give them one skull. That's definitely going to the path. And now they're going to put anything they can to the path because they don't want us to gain the three victory points. And it's that last path of the game. So any amount they go over it, they get those points. The time of the reserve is gone. Our Aragorn player literally has one card that they can use. The rest of these don't work. And we can't play the file until we get Frodo out. So we're just going to cycle a card. We're going to cycle, what is this, the Guards of the Citadel? Useless. Saruman will flip his card, and you know what he gets is Saruman. He actually can't be placed on the path, thank goodness. So right now he'll be in the reserve, but he's going to add one shield if we do try and take down Orthanc. The Frodo player is definitely going to place out Frodo onto the path using the Dwarven Axe to play it, so we'll cycle this. This means we're now tied one to one on the path. The Witch King will respond by flipping his next card. He has the Lidless Eye. This card cannot be played or moved to the path if a Shadow back, uh, Battleground is active. Oh, okay, there is a Shadow Battleground active, so it cannot go to the path. However, when played, each Shadow player draws one card. So we're going to get another card here and another card for the Saruman deck. The Aragorn player had some pretty epic moments. This is going to be the last action they can do. File of Galadriel given to Frodo Baggins at the ninth hour. That will add two shields, not to the wielder, but actually to the path itself. If we can win that path, I think we're guaranteed to win this game. Oh no, we have the Haradrim regulars. If in reserve, use an action and cycle this card to activate the Harad if it's in the Shadow Battleground, which it is. So they're going to do that next time, and that's going to give them another point. I can't believe I'm actually going to do this, but I am going to use the ring for our action for Frodo. Frodo, you're right there. But we're going to grab Sting because of it. That was worth it. And what's our other one? We have Narya. Totally not worth it. I didn't realize that we must have cycled Smeagol a while ago. I thought Smeagol was still in there. That's why I did that. We have the Reaver. The Reaver's not going to go to reserve. The Reaver's going to go right to the path. That will be two skulls to three shields. Now the Haradrim regulars will cycle themselves, and that will mean we have another location put out. Harad is the immense land south of Gundor and Mordor. Its main port is Umbar, the base of the Corsairs of Umbar, whose ships serve as the Dark Lord Sauron's fleet. Its people are the Haradrim or Southrons. Their warriors wear scarlet and gold and are armed with swords and round shields. Some ride gigantic elephants called Mummakil. They become mixed with Numenorean settlers, some of whom fall under the sway of Sauron as black Numenoreans. By the time of the War of the Ring, the Haradrim are under the dominion of Sauron, and the Haradrim Corsairs provide the whole of his black fleet. This card is just mean, because it says each shadow player draws a card, so they're just going to get more cards. We're definitely going to place Sting on Frodo. That's only going to give him one of the additional shields, but maybe a monstrosity character will show up there. And if that happens, it'll give him plus two. Frodo has used the ring, has Sting, and the file of Galadriel. Really, that should be Sam, but otherwise, that's pretty awesome. Okay, we have the Mordor orcs. Beautifully, can't do anything. They're just going to go to to the reserve. At this point, the Aragorn player is just popping himself some popcorn. Not much he can do. We've got the White Hand. That's not going to do anything. It's just going to go into reserve. Looking at the hand we have for the Frodo player, I think I'll play the Riders of Rohan and discard Ent Draft to the uh, cycle pile to do that. We're coming in at two attack to two defense, so it doesn't do anything. <laughs> I just wanted to have them out there. I can't believe this whole game we hardly used the Rohirrim. To be fair, we did use them at Helm's Deep. It was just Gandalf that did the final blow. The Messenger, another skull, another one to the path. This does say, draw up to five cards one at a time, play the first Nazgul character drawn, and then stop. Oh my gosh. So that's not a Nazgul, that's one. This one is a Nazgul, so both of these are going to go to the path. I'm thinking that they are going to take me on for this one. I have one, two, three, four. They have one, two, three, four for now. Uh, that's not going to last. Saruman will then draw his next card. He has a hill troll. They've got a hill troll. He's also going to go to the path. At this point, it's just going to be about what they draw. Uh, we have the Fell Beast. Choose. Add two attack and two defense to a Nazgul on a battleground. There isn't one. Forsake two cards to add one corruption or draw two cards. 
I don't want to draw two cards. I don't want to add the corruption yet. And maybe these cards won't be good. So we'll just add the two cards. This is the only card left in their cycle deck. So we'll put that there. Saruman will then flip his next card. And he has the Fighting Urukai, useless. We'll just put those in reserve. And at this point, we'll just jump back and forth between these two. Which King is this side? We have the Trolls. They can't do anything. Over here, we have another Cave Troll. 8 to 9. He can go to the path from the Saruman deck. Went back to the Witch King. We've got Mordor Orcs. And we've got Mordor Orcs. That's what I was wondering. So we did save that. Well, this might be tighter than what I'd like. We're going to lose the Riders of Rohan. Whatever. They're going to gain 3 points with both of these battlegrounds. Then, we have a total of 1, 2, 3, 4 shields here. So that's going to cancel out 1, 2, 3, 4. That means they only scored two corruption on that last path, but they did win the last path, giving them two more points. Let's count up for the final score. We, of course, used both of our rings, so we don't get to count those. We have 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. We have 18. They have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. They just beat us in that last round. Oh, think if I had not used those two rings. Now, I, I needed to use that one ring. That got me Aragorn to give me those three points. So I think no matter what, we would have lost. But if I hadn't used the ring for the Frodo player, which I don't think I really needed to, we could have maybe tied them, uh, which would have still meant we lost. But that was so close and so much fun. As always, thank you so much for watching, subscribing, liking, commenting, doing all those fun things on our channel. We really appreciate it. Berndt and I love showing you guys fun games, and I hope you enjoyed this video. You couldn't get much more epic than that. We did take Minas Tirith, and we took Helm's Deep, and yet we still lost the game. Oh! <laughs> so good. If you're excited to see what Berndt and I have in store for you on this channel, then I need you to meet me at the table. Bye, everyone.